Designing Vaccines, a presentation by Anthony, Nisha, Zach, Kai, and Daphne. Vaccines are an important technology that protect the general population from many diseases, limiting the risk of a potential epidemic. Vaccines work by creating an infection scenario with a weakened pathogen. The immune system is able to easily fight off the weakened disease and remembers it, which then allows a much quicker response for future infections by the same pathogen. Some vaccines, called polyvalent vaccines, can even protect against multiple strains of pathogen. There are three different groups of vaccines, whole pathogen, subunit, and nucleic acid. Antigens are the specific protein structure that antibodies attach to. Because it does not contain the whole pathogen, vaccines made with antigens often come with lesser side effects and are more reliable to use. However, with multiple strains of pathogens, it is harder to make a vaccine that covers all strains because the antigen structure may vary. Whole pathogen vaccines can be divided into inactivated and live attenuated vaccines. Inactivated vaccines introduce dead pathogens to your body, but the immune response may not be as strong because the pathogen is dead. Live attenuated vaccines introduce weakened pathogens and are more comparable to infection by the real disease. However, because they are still alive, they have a chance of introducing a serious infection. Subunit vaccines contain only the antigens that induce the immune system and adjuvants to boost immune response. Protein-based subunit vaccines use specific protein parts that antibodies bind to and induce an immune response. Because proteins can denature, you can edit their structure to give it greater stability. Conjugate subunit vaccines use the polysaccharide capsule found on bacteria to induce the immune response. Nucleic acid vaccines consist of recombinant protein, DNA plasmid, and mRNA vaccines. Recombinant protein vaccines use protein antigens created by harmless cells using gene editing. DNA plasmid vaccines allow cells to directly create the antigen through plasmids, which increase immune response and stability. Because DNA plasmids are relatively easier to produce, vaccine development can be quicker. mRNA vaccines are similar to DNA plasmid vaccines, but uses mRNA to code for the antigen protein instead. Scientists are continually trying to reduce the instability and difficulty of delivering mRNA. There are three different ways to choose which antigens to use in a vaccine. Immunogenicity refers to the pathogen's ability to provoke an immune response in its host. For vaccines, we want an antigen that is highly immunogenic to create a stronger immune response. Traditional vaccinology has been around the longest and provides highly immunogenic antigens. However, it is limited to the antigens we are familiar with. Reverse vaccinology was developed more recently and uses genome sequencing and analysis to sequence the pathogen's genome and find all available antigens, although most are not as immunogenic. Lastly, structural vaccinology is often used with reverse vaccinology to narrow down the list of antigens to test. It uses methods such as mass spectrometry, x-ray crystallography, and electron microscopy to first determine the structure of the antigen and then remodel it to optimize its epitope presentation. The epitope is an important term to know. It refers to the part of the antigen molecule where the antibody attaches itself to. The epitope is important in that it allows the antibody to recognize the antigen and call for an immune response. Because epitopes conform to the 3D shape of the antigen, an antigen can be optimized to make the epitope more accessible. And epitopes are conformational. They are determined by the 3D shape of the protein and not by the amino acid sequence. Computational biology has played a big role in helping design and make vaccines. Computational biology has helped compare new antigens to the already known antigens in their existing epitopes. They can also predict where antibodies will attach to an antigen. Current softwares can run structural analysis that is needed to find the structure of an epitope. A current existing program that is called Immunoinformatics uses computer models to predict optimal binding sites of proteins in vaccines. If a region has an epitope, it can be used in a subunit vaccine 
or combined with other epitopes to create a polyvalent vaccine. Once the antigen and the epitope have been discovered, um, there's still a wide array of problems that can be additionally tackled that can further optimize the vaccine. For example, um, antigen diversity is a big problem because many diseases, their antigen or epitopes can easily mutate between different strains and that can make it difficult for one vaccine to be reliable and match all the different strains. Now, one way to tackle this is by finding similarities between epitope variants, and this allows you to kind of pick and choose the different parts that are similar and different and graph them together into one epitope or one antigen that allows antibodies to recognize all these different strains. And this can be done either through computational analysis looking at um, the similarities between the 3D models or by directly analyzing the 3D models and 3D images of these proteins. Now, one difficulty with this uh, problem is balancing the size of the epitopes because there's a minimum number of amino acids that you can take from each epitope before the antibody effectively, effectively recognizes it, but also you want to make sure that the amino acids that you add won't block the amino acids from a different epitope and ensure that all three will cause a sufficient reaction that antibodies can create a long-lasting protection against this strain. Another problem that can further help optimize the vaccine is um, the problem of antigen stability. So if you just take the antigen that is from the virus, it might not necessarily be stable. It might easily denature or um, change its form without the virus with it. And that can cause it to shift into a less desirable conformation or make it completely unrecognizable to antibodies. So computational analysis can help with this by finding changes to the amino acid sequence that can help stabilize this antigen. For example, finding amino acids that you can change that can create new bonds, hydrogen bonds or um, sulfide disulfide bonds, something like that, that can um, lock the antigen into its desired shape. Or you can completely remove parts of amino acids um, that may be weakening the structure that might not be part of the uh, epitope, but are still important. And um, you can also add amino acids to fill cavities or increase hydrophobic packing. And there's a lot of options out there that um, can help enhance the stability of the antigen. Occasionally, the native antigen just can't be stable enough to be in a good vaccine, no matter how much you uh, try and edit it. So in this case, you have, the op you have the option of taking the epitope and what you know about its structure and the structure of the native antigen and creating a completely new amino acid backbone um, to have the antigen on that can be potentially more stable and also more favorable as a vaccine and as an antigen to use. However, because it's not um, directly from the initial virus, um, even if you do have the epitope, there might be some side effects of having different, a drastically different antigen structure. So there's still a lot of questions about whether this can induce the correct reaction as a vaccine or not. A new vaccine called mRNA-1273, created by Moderna Incorporated, has displayed promising results against COVID-19. It targets the coronavirus spike protein and has induced neutralizing antibodies in 42 out of 45 patients after a second injection. The side effects of the vaccine consist of fatigue, chills, headache, muscle pain, and fever. The final stage trial will take place on July 27th. The company stated on March 23rd that a commercially available version of the vaccine would not be available for at least 12 to 18 months, but there could possibly be a version available for emergency use by fall of this year.